All right. So the beauty of the internet is that you are able to get so much information that you were not able to do so in the past. We had to go off and hunt for a photograph. So I thought, well, I'm going to try and find a really nice picture of uh, our guest speaker, Richard Tonkin. And the amazing the amount of information you can find out about someone. It, this gentleman's got a whole secret life that I didn't know about. So this is Richard Tonkin. He was the 2011 Mr. Australia National, built, not natural bodybuilding title. So there you go. <laughs> you mean it's fake news? <laughs> well, maybe his name is Richard Tonkin, but I don't think it's the same one. Okay, let's let's. Uh, so this uh, you might recognise this one, Richard. This is Richard on the left here over at. Uh, there you go. So without any ado. I'm going to now um, hand over to Richard. Um, he's going to give us a full details on the project that he was involved with. Um, he was at Melbourne University back in the 60s and involved in putting together and um, launching of uh, Australis Oscar V. So we're just going to take a couple of moments uh, and um, we're going to do a bit of a technology transfer here. We're gonna, we've got a, a small video to show first, Richard. And then, um, then Richard will give us his first-hand accounts and maybe answer. Yeah, th thanks, Peter, for the introduction. And thank you very much for uh, <coughs> inviting me tonight. Uh, I can see that I'm here amongst friends. Um, in uh, 1965, a group of uh, university students at Melbourne University, of which I was a member, um, got together, the, the, they, we were members of the Melbourne University Astronautical Society and of the Amateur Radio Club and uh, we began uh, tracking uh, American weather satellites and um, when we got sick of doing that somebody said and no one's ever owned up to who actually said it, um, why don't we build a satellite and uh, no one said well why not so we did. Uh, this uh, video, uh, which we're going to show now, was produced by a um, uh, a postgraduate uh, student in media at Flinders University last year, as part of her course. Um, she's a mature age student, and uh, she got a grant from the university to uh, to do the video, and uh, she got together some of the. Uh, original group that built the satellite which we call Australis. So uh, this um, uh, video is this is it's much about 15 minutes. It's it's the story of uh, what happened we did what we did and I think when that's finished I'll just do a short sl uh, slideshow uh, just to uh, uh, explain a bit more about what happened and then we can have some questions. Uh, okay thanks. He came up over the horizon. We're waiting and waiting and suddenly it was there, it was working. Very few people know that a group of students built the first Australian satellite. Nobody knows that anymore because it's history, it's been forgotten. But we're all still here and uh, uh, we think it's a story that's worth telling. Russia's first satellite is world news, and in Australia, scientists and astronomers are on duty day and night, tracking its orbit as it hurtles round the globe, 560 miles up in space. I was at boarding school, and the housemaster came and said, everyone, down tools, out onto the football ground. There it was, there was Sputnik, coming across the uh, sky, uh, and that really intrigued me, and I wanted to become the expert in space. The housemaster at my school said, uh, if you look up in the sky uh, over in that direction, uh, you will see Sputnik. And we said, what do we see? He said, it'll look like a faint star moving across the sky quite quickly. And we looked up and there it was. And from that moment, I was hooked. It was an interesting time to be growing up, fiddling around, building things, playing with fireworks, creating fireworks 
making rockets and firing rockets from 44 gallon drums. And I was going to a school which was a private school. And if you didn't play sport, you were an outcast. Uh, they, uh, they thought I was a bit weird. An absolute nerd. But I arrived at the university and there's a group of people who are equally enamoured, interested in space. I found out that there were other people like me. There were other geeks, even if I was a geek, and this was wonderful. And uh, I don't know who suggested the idea, why don't you build a satellite? But we all sort of said, well, that sounds like a good idea, why don't we? And some idiot, and it may well have been me, said, well, let's build a satellite. But we did. People we talked to all scoffed at this and said, this is ridiculous. No one's in Australia has ever built a satellite before. This was only a few years after Sputnik had been launched. We were 21 or two or something, and of course we could do it. We absolutely had no idea what we were in for, absolutely none. But we realised it's all very well building a satellite, you do have to get it launched. So we wrote to the Oscar project in the United States, they'd already launched four, and said, if we build a satellite, will you launch it for us? And they wrote back and said, if you build it, we'll try and get it launched. So we thought, oh dear, well that's calling our bluff, isn't it? That was all we needed. Of course, we went, went ahead immediately. Well, this is a replica, which is now a museum piece. The antennas like these are just straight bits of carpenter's tape. Just ordinary nuts and bolts. There's nothing fancy about it. Inside, you've got electronics, which looks like these hand-painted with um, nail varnish. And it was a matter of uh, going around begging and borrowing to get things. Testing the transmitters were done out in uh, somebody's backyard and because we were, couldn't read the meters from as far away as we were, he used a rifle with a telescopic sight to read the meters. So it was very, very agricultural. It turned out that our choices were quite unique, had never been done before, and so uh, the satellite, Australis Oscar 5, ended up with quite a number of firsts. Well, it was all built, it all worked, it's all fitted together and it all worked. The era we were going through, tremendous change from the 50s to the 60s, it was just mind-boggling. Free love, um, we didn't have the, any boundaries. Yeah, I don't think they knew anything about women, actually. I think they were just starting to learn about that when, when I met up with first Richard and then Rowan. Yes, I could not compete with the satellite. She was their mistress and you just have to give in after a while. We would sit down every night and watch the slaughter that was going on in Vietnam. You saw the napalm and the aftermath and, and it was horrific. Owen's marble was pulled out of the barrel and if your marble came out, um, then you had to go and do national service and obviously that meant going to Vietnam. He had asthma and he was allergic to beer, which sounds very improbable. So the night before his medical, we lined up all this beer. And so he wasn't a very well boy the next day when he went for his medical. Yes. You <laughs> deny it now that you ruffled my hair and said, hello, what's your name? You're cute. <laughs> He said, well, I'd like you to come around and cook dinner for us one night. And I said, well, OK, I don't mind. I don't mind cooking. I'll come and cook dinner for you. And I was going to cook a roast. So I've done all the vegetables. I've got the roast ready to go in. And I look over at the oven. And I look, I open the oven. And what's that in the oven? Bits of metal. And I don't know what... And then this person materialises behind me with Buddy Holly glasses. And he says, don't touch that. That's my satellite. <laughs> well, once it was built, three of us uh, took it over to California in June 1967. We were treated like celebrities. 
It was an utterly amazing experience. We saw things that few Americans would see. We saw Apollo command modules being made, including the first manned one. We were taken to the surveyor assembly line and uh, I said to one of the uh, engineers there, could I touch it? And he said, yes, uh, put this glove on and you can touch it if you really want to. Some months later, Surveyor 2 was launched and about um, five minutes uh, before it was to land on the moon and it exploded. And I often wondered whether <laughs> my touch may have had something to do with it. After we got back from the United States, we were sitting congratulating ourselves in our little cubby house in the physics building and a telephone call. I just happened to be close to the phone, picked it up and there was this very nervous woman said she was from Weapons Research Establishment. Could we please tell her about uh, our satellite? Yes, uh, yeah, fine. I told her, answered all the questions. And what did we have to hide? It was perfectly open and public. The very next day, uh, Resat was announced. Australia joined the Space Club of Nations by successfully launching on the 29th of November 1967 an Earth satellite of its own making. The project was an effort of the weapons research establishment. A bit annoyed about Resat because that was really, we really beat them to it. They built that because they didn't want a bunch of uh, uni students being first to launch a satellite. So that's the conspiracy theory and let's just continue it, why not? When we left America, we thought that uh, uh, the Americans would arrange a, uh, a launch with the Air Force, a, a launch which we thought would probably happen before the end of 1967. But it didn't, and, and we even thought we'd just get them to send it back and we'd put it in a museum somewhere because there was no other way we, we thought we could get a launch. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. NASA was busy, it was. There was the minor question of putting a man on the moon. I'm 21 years old. I was already in NASA. So these uh, Australian students had built this uh, scientific educational satellite and didn't have a way to get it launched. So in America, we thought we could get it launched, and so we tried. And there was a young engineer working on their unmanned uh, satellite launching rocket, Jan King, and Jan, um, was the leader of the group that went to NASA and said, look, we think we've found a spot on the, at the back of the second stage of the Delta rocket where we can fit the satellite in and it could be, uh, it could be launched that way. They said um, something along the lines of no, definitely no, and never. No, hell no, and never. I don't think there was any serious expectation on those, those young engineers' parts that they would become part of the space program. Jan and his group persisted. He persuaded NASA that it would be a great international relations exercise to uh, NASA would, would launch this um, amateur, amateur built satellite from a foreign country. It just so happened that I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. And that sort of continues on in this story. Ultimately, it, there was an awful lot of luck in, in, in all of this, that this, this all came to pass. This is AX3 WI with the Australis Oscar broadcast. As I said, I had this idea that, you know, after all this time, is it going to work? What happens if it doesn't? What damn fools will, will seem to be? T minus five, four, three, two, one. This is uh, AX 3 WI with uh, Australian, with Victorian coverage of the Astralis launch. We were waiting and waiting, and we knew it must have been almost overhead, and we, you know, nobody had heard it here. Everything's okay. Telemetries, uh, telemetry signals are all reading nominally. Uh, DJ4ZC has tracked the satellite on 
and suddenly out of the static, did it, did it, did it, and it was, it was there, it was working. Well, you are carrying a transmission of the Australis Oscar 5 project. It's now a project, it's no longer a launch, it's uh, successful. <laughs> you know, all, all this pent up sort of excitement of, uh, of, uh, that had been building up for, well, for years, uh, suddenly it was in orbit, it was working, it was, um, it was amazing, it's, it's, it succeeded, we'd done it. I think back now is when I was a child, I used to have toy rockets and things like that. And now I'm actually getting to put things in the sky. So we got together as a group of students. Um, we initially started just electrical engineering students. Um, and the idea was to build a satellite, um, which is obviously pretty exciting and pretty engaging. And we had no idea how to do it. When we first started, we didn't know until the first few weeks into it. And we started researching. We're like, hey, like, there was this group, Australis Oscar 5, that did you know, a similar thing back in the you know, late 60s. In 1970, they launched it. See, so how amazing is it? So we're talking you know, this, you know, April 1966. Uh, Sydney today, the, Australian, the first Australian-built satellite will be launched in the United States at the end of this year. How inspiring. Amazing. Jan, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's really been has. a long time. Yeah, and then Troy McCann, who's the leader of the, of the group there, contacted me and said, would uh, I like to come along and some of the uh, Australia's group would like to come along and tell them about what we'd done uh, all those years ago. Um, and it's really interesting every time we talk to someone like Richard Tonkin or anyone from Australia Oscar 5. Yeah, I, I really do feel like we, uh, we're carrying the mantle and carrying the torch on. I hope that they can do what, uh, what we didn't do, and that is to establish a business for themselves personally so that they've got a, a career to move into if they want to do that. Look, I think it's a great idea to have a space industry. I think it's um, one of a number of industries we should be doing. Uh, don't be put off. Do it. Follow your heart and do it. I think Australia has to say, yes, I can do it. I am a big guy too. And put together the organisation and just do it. All right. So the beauty of the internet is that you are able to get so much information that you were not able to do so in the past. We had to go off and hunt for a photograph. So I thought, well, I'm going to try and find a really nice picture of uh, our guest speaker, Richard Tonkin. And the amazing the amount of information you can find out about someone. It, this gentleman's got a whole secret life that I didn't know about. So this is Richard Tonkin. He was the 2011 Mr. Australia National Built Natural Bodybuilding title. So there you go. <laughs> you mean it's fake news? <laughs> well, maybe his name is Richard Tonkin, but I don't think he's the same one. Okay, let's let's. Uh, so this uh, you might recognise this one, Richard. This is Richard on the left here over at, uh, there you go. So, without any ado, I'm going to now um, hand over to Richard. Um, he's going to give us a full details on the project that he was involved with. Um, he was at Melbourne University back in the 60s and involved in putting together and um, launching of uh, Australis Oscar V. So we're just going to take a couple of moments uh, and um, we're going to do a bit of a technology transfer here. We're gonna, we've got a, a small video to show first, Richard, and then, um, then Richard will give us his first-hand accounts and maybe answer. Yeah, th thanks, Peter, for the introduction. And thank you very much for uh, <coughs> inviting me tonight. Uh, I can see that I'm here amongst friends. Um, in uh, 19... Uh, 65, a group of uh, university students at Melbourne University, of which I was a member, um, got together. They, they, we were members of the Melbourne University Astronautical Society and of the Amateur Radio Club, and uh, we began uh, tracking uh, American weather satellites, and um, when we got sick of doing that, somebody said, and no one's ever owned up to who actually said it, um, why don't we build a satellite and uh, no one said well why not so we did uh, this uh, video uh, which we're going to show now was produced by a um, uh, a postgraduate uh, student in media at Flinders University last year as part of her course um, she's a mature age student and uh, she got a grant from the university to uh, to do the video, and uh, she got together some of the uh, 
original group that built the satellite, which we call Astralis. So uh, this um, uh, video is this is it's much about 15 minutes. It's it's the story of uh, what happened. We did what we did, and I think when that's finished, I'll just do a short uh, slideshow uh, just to uh, uh, explain a bit more about what happened, and then we can have some questions. Uh, okay, thanks. He came up over the horizon. We're waiting and waiting and suddenly it was there, it was working. Very few people know that a group of students built the first Australian satellite. Nobody knows that anymore because it's history, it's been forgotten. But we're all still here and uh, uh, we think it's a story that's worth telling. Then we advanced to the monster, that's a quadrilis which we built, uh, mostly to scrap metal that we uh, brought from a place called Mardelli's uh, scrap yard in, uh, in North Melbourne, where she sold the bus for a, a, a huge variety of, uh, of material. Uh, the, uh, the elevation uh, motor in a DC3 prop pitch, ac uh, prop propeller pitch actuator uh, electric motor. Uh, and we ran that in a remote control uh, uh, room about uh, 100 metres away at the old physics building at Milton University. And that's one of the uh, satellite components which was a soldering iron to show the, uh, uh, to show the, uh, the deferred size. And some more of the circuit boards. We, uh, we didn't really have any money. We had a small grant from the university which helped with uh, out of pocket expenses, but almost all of the components were. Uh, uh, were donated by an electronics company, Dukon and Fairchild and so on. And we asked them for their very best uh, transistors and other components and, uh, and they gave it to us. That's the high tier. The, uh, the, the uh, telemetry was a seven channel system uh, which was mostly house fitted. The Charles was a sort of advanced Sputnik 1. Uh, it, was, uh, uh, it, it wasn't a communication satellite. It was, uh, uh, it had two transmitters to be picked up by the radio operators around the world. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the telemetry segment ran for about uh, 60 or 70 seconds for three of the seven channels. And at the end of the segments, it, uh, it transmitted high in, uh, in Morse code. Uh, more of the circuitry. Now, that's the complete satellite uh, with its. Uh, uh, with its uh, Cut of the move. I've been told I shouldn't even try to uh, use the laser pointer because they're too complicated for me. But the, in, the, in the middle uh, uh, it was a battery pack. Uh, we didn't have, we couldn't have bought solar cells, so it, uh, it was a battery pack from the. Uh, ah, that's the one of the. We've got it. Uh, aha! Uh, that's the, uh, the battery pack there. Uh, Union Carbide sent it over uh, from the States for us. That and we ran over the spring wells, uh, where the, uh, the springs which were made by the, especially made of course by the Henderson's Federal Spring Works in, uh, in Flemington. Uh, and uh, we went to them and said, We want two springs to pitch a satellite out of a rocket. And they looked as if it was an Alice as if they were crazy. But they, they did build them and they, they, built, they built them. And otherwise, they Various electronic modules are uh, are centered around the uh, around the satellite and the battery packs in the middle. Um, you saw this before, I think. This is when, when we took the, the satellite to the states. We were these Oscar and the radio people had very good connections in Silicon Valley, and uh, we had a, uh, a grand tour. And that's not a flight unit; it's a uh, it's just a mock-up of a command module which they use for uh, sending and so on. That's Aaron Aaron Nace who was recently uh, in conjunction uh, to uh, celebrate or to fit into the IOC in Adelaide has written a book on the start of my brought a couple of my uh, of my, my uh, copies here which I can show you if you're interested in uh, getting in touch with a couple of John knows a good story. Uh, that's me with a with an early ranger uh, at JPL in uh, in uh, Pasadena. Uh, that's uh, Owen and 
called down the, on the road there, one of the other two of the three of us will know to put the traffic on this page. Uh, that's a second, I think, stage of, uh, of one of the set. Thank you. Okay, right. Hey, I was a law student. I mean, I, <laughs> how do I ever get involved with this? So, my technical knowledge is a bit sticky. Uh, that was the um, case of the Tate Tap that they were the pattern that they put on the satellite before it was launched. Uh, the, uh, the gold that they put on the satellite before it was launched. The gold foil there, uh, there was, um, uh, was supposed to uh, keep it at a, uh, or to keep it at a reasonable sort of room temperature. That's one of the type of the steel mill antennas uh, which, uh, uh, which were on the, on the satellite. I mean, it's a simple system, and, uh, uh, but it works with different things around the, uh, around the satellite, and when it's ejected, they spring out and they start doing it. Uh, that was just a uh, photo of the launch. Uh, as you saw from the video, uh, uh, it was fairly dark. It was launched at 5.31 in the morning in Vandenberg on a very foggy day, so the launch pictures aren't very good. Um, uh, that was a letter which we sent to uh, the Minister for Air in March 66, which shows that the government knew uh, a year and a half before RISAP was launched that we were building the satellite. Uh, we never got back to the bill. And they, we never got a, a telegram or anything from the government after it was launched. They just ignored it. Uh, okay, now that's the, uh, the top. Uh, uh, site there, you can access that video on that uh, on that ex uh, on that on that site there. You have to put the dot com as Australis dot dash Oscar dash Weebly dot Weebly, and uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the address for the publisher of Kerry's books and the books that the book that are most most run on the uh, on the satellite. Uh, I think I'm a bit out of, out of time. Now I've got. Two minutes to go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Australia really shouldn't have happened. Uh, a lot of things uh, uh, could have conspired to uh, prevent it. First of all, the Oscar people could have said, we're not going to launch, we're not going to uh, uh, organise a launch for a foreign built satellite. Uh, secondly, when the American military uh, stopped uh, uh, launching the Oscar satellites uh, because they classified their programs, uh, it sent the guy's garage in a plastic box in uh, Palo Alto in San Francisco for two and a half years. Uh, just doing nothing and we thought it would have to come back. As the video said, uh, you know, box is a box yeah, is a museum piece. And then this uh, in the radio group at Goddard Space Flight Centre in Virginia took up the cause and Ken King, who was an engineer on the video, uh, he almost single-handedly uh, uh, persuaded uh, the authorities to get it launched after the uh, after the American uh, Weather Bureau, or NOAA, uh, said that they wouldn't uh, allow it to be flown as a secondary payload on one of their experimental weather satellites. Uh, uh, Jack King went to the, uh, his boss, got out, his boss went to Thomas Paine, who was the then National Administrator, and uh, Tom Paine uh, uh, reportedly went to NOAA and said, um, I think this is a great international uh, uh, exercise of good publicity for NASA and shows that we've got money internationally. He also is our friend to do it. And he said to uh, the NOAA boss, a report he said to the NOAA boss, um, now we can do this nicely, we can do it nicely. Uh, he said, uh, uh, either you agree or I uh, pull rank, it's my rocket and maybe your satellite, but it's not, and he did. And finally, uh, the last, although the Delta II became an extremely uh, reliable uh, launch vehicle, in fact, it's not the, um, uh, there's a, a weather satellite going up from Vandenberg. If that succeeds, it will be the 99th consecutive success for the uh, Delta II, and the last one's going up uh, next, uh, next year. And if that succeeds, it'll be 100 success, and that's the end of the Delta II. But at this stage, in 1970, of the previous four launches, uh, only two have worked. So we had a pretty good uh, chance of ending up in the South Pacific Ocean. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, sure. Just the logistics thing. You, 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 you went over to the United States, the three of you, to deliver the satellite. Yeah, we took it over. Uh, quite a very kindly uh, air freighted the satellite over for us for free. 
And when we asked them for the three or five big price tickets, they said no. So we had to get it from elsewhere. <laughs> and did anyone go over to witness the launch? No, no. So we were just poor students at the at that point and we uh, we couldn't do that. Uh, as you see, we wouldn't have seen much anyway. Yeah. So the batteries would have had to be changed just exactly. before flight? Yeah. So good, good question. They were replaced uh, in the interstate, so uh, they, 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 they died. Uh, and uh, it operated for about six weeks, which was about the uh, planned operating time. Um, and the paint, uh, or the, the, uh, the colour pattern on the, on the satellite didn't work, and it got up to about 50 degrees by the third order. We lost the modulation on the high frequency transmitter uh, on the, at about that time. So the telemetry wasn't coming through the, uh, between, the, between uh, the transmitter. Uh, it came and went a bit during the flight. Uh, the other VHF transmitter was fine. And we had a command receiver on it. We could turn the VHF transmitter, which was doing more power than the VHF one, on and off. So we turned it on at the weekend, so the end was around the world to listen to it. We turn it off again, and as the battery, um, as the battery bomb started to go down, the temperature, the, the high temperature, shortened the we look at the life by probably one or two weeks. It got harder and harder to command it, and uh, there was a guy at Birchett who was our main command station, an amateur radio operator in, uh, in, in Birchett, in Victoria, and he was putting a lot of power through his uh, transmitter uh, at the time he claimed. There was an ionised glow at night on the on the on the helix where you see the uh, the signal just a little bit over the over the legal limit I suppose. But uh, we were still able to command it, but it's uh, it got a bit dead. So. Yeah, sure. Uh, during the building stage when you guys at the university were putting it together, had you come across any um, have you done, did any research into things like um, um, specifications or standards for spaceworthiness of vehicles for a spacecraft? And then when you actually put, took it over to the States and handed it over to NASA, what sort of feedback did they give you? They said, oh, it's too heavy, or did they make any space worthiness recommendations? What sort of feedback did you get? So did you know what you were building to, and then what did NASA say about it when you handed it to them? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So, so the shape of the satellite, uh, uh, the, um, the OSCAR 3 uh, and the satellite, which had been launched a couple of years before, uh, was this shape, it was a rectangular box, and we asked the Oscar people when they said yes, how to build it. We said what shape could it be, and they said, oh, well, we don't know. If it goes up to the uh, Aflora Gino on the, on the Discovery Spy Satellite uh, program, which commanded the which we expected it would, it should be about the same shape as Oscar 3. So we got the Oscar 3 measurements, and we just put it in the new box, and that was it. Uh, the specifications, we just, uh, well, the guys did some reading, certainly, uh, but uh, uh, but they uh, basically got the best container, we got the best containers we could uh, to, uh, to build it. So they weren't necessarily space qualified, but Fairchild and New Model and so on and so on told us it was the best, uh, told us that they had the best containers that we could, uh, that we could build. So. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the people at uh, California and also who worked in the industry in Silicon Valley and also the people at Goddard said, uh, yes, it was good. They said it was, uh, you know, it was fairly basic, which it was, uh, but they, they were happy that it was all right. And, uh, they did a bit of, they, they did some vibration testing, which we hadn't done, and they did vacuum testing, which we hadn't, hadn't done. Um, uh, we could have, I mean, there was a, the Army had a, uh, a facility in Maryland on where we could have done the, and the vacuum and the vibration, but we weren't being put to that system. So they said, you know, it was fine, it was, uh, they were placing some of the components, but otherwise, the satellite, apart from the batteries, was what you said open. Yeah. This one thing is interesting to me, too, because I had just gotten my ham radio license that year, and our local club mm. was set up after it was launched to go near the beacon. So. Oh, you heard, you heard it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great, that's uh, terrific, yeah. Terrific, uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Norad told us, or we heard from Norad recently, uh, that uh, it's, it's in a 1,450 kilometre, uh, almost circular polar retrograde orbit, and uh, the estimated life's 100,000 years. Reset, reset lasts, lasts in 46 days. So what up first could it be if we had the, we had the last laugh? Mike? No, I was just going to say, Mike, we'd better start switching over to the thing. Um, 
Thank you, Richard. That was fascinating. Pretty much in the same bit of And that book's available, so. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll put the book on the table for them. I'm not selling it, it is my private copies, but uh, that modern uh, uh, address, it, all you've got to do is atpress.com, not all the rest of it, uh, and uh, you go to new books that will come up on the, uh, on the screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.